there is a, a, a complete genocidal fever that has overtaken Israel. And, and um, Israelis and the Israeli army have been not only attacking the Gaza Strip, and I, I do want to make clear all eyes should be on Gaza. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, a member of ICAD USA and Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, both co-sponsors of today's interview. During these dire days, we're grateful to spend uh, a little time with political analyst and Palestinian Canadian lawyer, Diana Butu from Palestine. Diana, uh, welcome and thank you for uh, just taking taking this precious time to be with us. I'm sure these are overwhelming days for you. Thank you. Um, I, I really want to thank you for, for hosting this and and for inviting me, um, I wish I could have come and visited in person. But as you know, um, there's a genocide happening in uh, in Gaza, and it it's imperative for people who are here to bear witness, to um, talk about it, and and to keep making the world see and hear. Um, exactly what's happening. So I, I thank you very much for accommodating me, um, even though I couldn't come in person and hosting this uh, via Zoom. Uh, before we get into all the issues that we need to talk about, uh, how are you and how are your family? Um, Michael, you know, we're devastated. Um, look, I'm personally safe. I, I live in, in Haifa and Haifa is about 180 kilometers, or I don't, I don't know how to do it in miles, uh, but fairly far away from the Gaza Strip. So per physically I'm safe, but but there is a, a, a complete genocidal fever that has overtaken Israel. And, and um, Israelis and the Israeli army have been not only attacking the Gaza Strip, and I, I do want to make clear all eyes should be on Gaza, but they've also carried out attacks in in the West Bank, um, settlers have been carrying out attacks, and I'm happy to talk more about that uh, yeah. this evening as well. But it's not just in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, but also inside 48, inside Israel, where we see that Israelis have been pulling together um, demonstrations with chants, the death to Arabs. Uh, we've seen that... Um, that students have been expelled from university, not for anything that they've done on campus, but for simply liking a social media post. We've seen that people have lost their jobs here. Again, not for anything that they did in the workplace, but for simply liking a social media post. Yeah. We've seen scores of arrests. And I think the most alarming thing that we've seen so far is that neighborhood militias have now been formed in cities all across the country where where you ha literally have your neighbor spying on you and putting you on a watch list um, because you're a person who believes in Palestinian liberation or because you're speaking out against this against this very brutal war. And, and so the feeling is that even though we're physically safe, that um, that it's just a question of time before the Israelis then come after us as well. Well, we keep uh, what we keep uh, emphasizing is that context is important. This certainly, this certainly was not unprovoked, um, uh, and it didn't come from nowhere. You recently observed, I think it was with an interview with Andrea Mitchell, who was trying in her own way, but you know she framed things. She framed things as uh, wanting you to denounce Hamas, but uh, you framed it this way. The problem is that I don't think that this is put in its proper political context. This isn't just a war. It's actually an occupation that has gone on for 56 years. The sad reality is that for all these years, everybody's focused only on Israel's security, leaving aside anything when it comes to Palestinians. 
and Palestinians have lived in such insecurity over the course of the past 56 years. Yeah. Yeah, the, you know, October 7th didn't happen in a vacuum. And it's important to keep that in mind. And to try to somehow turn this into a, a situation where history began on October 7th is quite frankly, Michael, the height of dehumanization. Why? Because it ignores what Israel has been doing to Palestinians, not just for 56 years, but for 75 years. It it, it somehow assumes that that what Israel has done to us is, um, is okay, but worse than that, it normalizes it. And it's as though it's, you Palestinians are just put on this earth to suffer. And it's only when there's a response back that the world's attention then gets turned to what's happening. Again, it's the height of dehumanization. And this has been part of the problem is that we can't look forward to things like solutions or moving forward if we don't understand where it is that we came from. And the fact that we have, um, that we as Palestinians have had to live through this for such a long time is, is not only reprehensible, um, but it just shows you the pathetic weakness of the international community. And, and you know, Michael, when I, I don't know if I got it across so well with Andrea, but, um, but what I do want people to understand is that occupation is violent. Every aspect of it is violent. To maintain an occupation requires violence. Um, to steal somebody's land requires violence. To put up a checkpoint and to monitor people's movement requires violence. To arrest people always in the middle of the night and with accompanied by soldiers is violent. To throw people in prison is is violent. To 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 shut down um, NGOs is violent. To demolish a home is violent. All of it is violence and. And the, because it's been it's been meted out for 56 years in terms of the occupation, but 75 when you look at the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, and because it's done in these drips, the world has ignored it, and and now they can't ignore it anymore. They can't. You know, it. just as October 7th didn't come out of nowhere, these uh, Palestinian fighters who entered Israel and killed Israelis on October 7th didn't come out of nowhere I'm, I'm thinking of growing up uh, under uh, this uh, brutal occupation uh, blockade rationing calories uh, poisoning fields I'm, I'm just trying to think of uh, uh, the the, tr the trauma of Palestinian babies and children growing up in there who turn into then um, you know it, it's easy for us to try to to try to uh, re retain this moral objectivity, you know, uh, and superiority in the West, as if, as if we can keep our hands clean, which they, which we can't. And I'm trying to think of the traumatized children who grew up to be these uh, uh, Palestinian fighters who then attack Israel. Talk to us a little bit about that kind of trauma. You know, no Palestinian wants to be a fighter. Um, Every Palestinian just wants to have a simple, free life. It, we, we want the same things that everybody around the world um, wants and that other people around the world have and we don't have, which is freedom. And and I can tell you, Michael, I lived in the Gaza Strip for a year and a half um, between the years of 2005 to mid-2006. Now, so that people understand the context, this was before the blockade. And uh, But what I'm about to describe um, sounds a lot like the blockade, but those were the good old days. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm saying that that uh, what I'm about to describe sounds like a blockade is because it was. Since the 1990s, Israel has imposed some type of closure on the Gaza Strip. Remember, you know, the Gaza Strip, for those who who, um, who may not be aware, it's really, it's the size of Detroit. That's it. Um, with four times the population of Detroit. But unlike Detroit, where people can go other places and leave, the people in Gaza are stuck in the Gaza Strip. Almost 80% of the population of Gaza are refugees from 1948. 50% of them are children. 
And and when I lived there, as I said, there was a there was some type of a closure that had been in place from the 90s. But it intensified over the years. And when I lived in there in 2005, 2006, I remember the very extreme rations that we had. Things like not being able to get uh, flour and having rations when it came to bread in Gaza City. I remember not seeing dairy products on the shelves in, in stores. I remember um, feeling the the lack of of clean water and in fact i remember when i lived there i lived in a in one of these high rise buildings one of the buildings that israel bombed back in 2021 um that when i when i uh used to wash my hair because the water was was coming from the sea and so contaminated um the chunks of my hair used to fall out and and, and when you live there and you see that the children who live there don't have a future. Um, and when I think about the blockade that began 2007, and here we are in 2023, yeah. that's 17 years later. That's an entire generation of kids who grew up never knowing anything. I remember the mother of Mohamed Durra. Mohamed Durra was the young boy during the, the second intifada, who you saw cowering with his father um, in, in Gaza, and, and he ends up being shot by an Israeli and, and, and dies, and you see his father just totally in shock. I remember in 2005 visiting the mother of Mohammed al Durra, and at the time she said to me, You know, I, I just want my children to be able to open up their eyes one day and see a day of freedom. And I, I think about Imam Ahmed a lot because none of her children have been able to open their eyes and see a day of freedom. None of them, not a single one of them. Right before uh, I uh, we began this uh, webinar, Diana, you were talking about a podcast uh, conversation that you just had. You want to share that with the rest of the group? Yes. Um, I I host a podcast <laughs> called, called "This Is Palestine." For those of you who are interested, it's a it's a I, it's a good podcast. I like it. Um, not just because I host it. That's not the reason I like it. I like because I think it's interesting, and I think that there's a lot of topics that mainstream media uh, doesn't cover. I just finished an interview just before coming on with uh, Doctor Tarek Lubani. Um, Dr. Tarek Lubani is a Canadian Palestinian doctor, his emergency trauma doctor, who spent a number of, who's, who's been to the Gaza Strip many, many, many times, and spent a, a lot of uh, months, if not years, at Shifa Hospital. And uh, he also, by the way, in case anybody's interested, was a doctor who in 2018 was shot by the Israeli army uh, as he was treating people during the Great Return March. Uh, he was shot in both legs. He was telling me that based on his work as an emergency trauma doctor, that um, first he was debunking the idea that Shifa Hospital is uh, is a base for anything other than a hospital. Um, but then secondly, he was talking about what it's like to be a, a, a trauma doctor in Gaza now and the the things that he has been hearing from his colleagues, everything from maggots um, that are infecting almost all of the wounds because they don't have the proper means of sterilization to what he fears is going to be mass deaths due to starvation because uh, Palestinians are not getting the necessary um, food and water supplies, um, as well as obviously fuel and electricity. Um, it's very harrowing. And what Israel's is perpetrating right now is a genocide. I, I think that we have to be very clear about it. Um, it's genocide It's and it's ethnic cleansing. And I feel helpless because nobody's stopping Israel at this point. You know, speaking about, uh, speaking about, uh, speaking about doctors, this, well, this, uh, this, uh, this, I'm getting uh, a little bit of feedback now. Getting a little bit of feedback now. Let's let's keep trying. Okay. Um, 
speaking about doctors, uh, just yesterday, I mean, talk about cynical and shameless. Uh, just yesterday, about 90 Israeli, quote, doctors for the rights of IDF soldiers urged the bombing of any and every hospital in Gaza as, quote, legitimate targets for annihilation. And crocodile tears from Israel and U.S. feigning moral authority because they say, see what they made us do to them. I mean, who does that? Israelis. Yeah. The Israelis. yeah. Exactly. Look, the, the Israelis have, uh, have, have a long history of, of, uh, of blaming us for our own deaths. Um, and not only blaming us for our own deaths, but then blaming us for them killing us. Um, you know, Golda Meir famously said, we will never forgive the Palestinian people for forcing us to, to, yeah. to kill them. Um, look, <laughs> it's, this isn't just this letter, Michael. There, it's, and it's not just the 100 doctors. It's, um, it's beyond that. We've seen rabbis who've come forward also urging the Netanyahu government, urging Netanyahu to bomb Gaza, uh, to bomb a Shifa hospital. We've also seen the Israelis joke about it in, in in caricatures in their you know their cartoons in newspapers, and just today we saw the same in the Washington Post. There was yeah. a very sick caricature in the Washington Post. Palestinians have been so dehumanized that um, that anything that Israel says sticks, and anything that they want to do goes. Um, it, it can be done. And this is the part that is so alarming is that there are no red lines. In fact, we heard the spokesperson for um, Kirby yesterday come out and say, confirm that there are no red lines. Yeah. That's the dangerous part. This isn't just against Palestinians. We've This is against humanity. Humanity has fallen apart. And if we can't recognize that a country, an occupier, shouldn't be allowed to bomb a refugee camp, shouldn't be allowed to bomb children, shouldn't be allowed to get away with making genocidal statements like uh, invoking um, Amalek in the Old Testament to saying, uh, calling people the children of light versus the children of darkness, to having members of Knesset say Nakba 2.0. Um, to have the foreign minister say that Gaza is going to be smaller in size, to have a former foreign minister say that that Palestinians should be thrown into into the Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula with the Arab world paying for it, to then have a minister of heritage saying that nuking Gaza is an option for which he was reprimanded, by the way, um, not for the nuking Gaza is an option but for finally revealing the, yeah, the worst sure. kept secret in the Middle East, which is that Israel has several nuclear weapons. Um, you know, this is the, this, this is the, the environment that we are living in. And, and I, as somebody who lives here, I'm looking on with horror when I see people like Lindsey Graham say flatten, flatten Gaza or, or Nikki Haley come out and say, um, finish them. And uh, and Israelis taking this as the green light uh, to do exactly that. There's been, uh, I mean, we know the general answer, but let me let me let me uh, uh, name a few of the reasons uh, that Hamas may have attacked attacked at, at this particular moment. Jerusalem journalist, I'm sure you know Nathan Thrall, uh, called uh, called this quote suicidal the decision to wittingly knowingly undertake this comes from a sense that there are no other options that there's nothing left to lose and i i'm going to list four different maybe reasons why it might be it might have been possible that hamas attacked at this time mm -hmm. you have number one the most racist government in israel's history takes the mask off of the zionist enterprise really number two Palestinian overtures to peace, overtures for peace have been just rejected out of hand. The Abraham Accords, where peace has been trying to be made, where the U.S. is trying to buy off other Arab allies, and with, like uh, foregoing any kind of discussions with Palestinians, bypassing Palestinians. And four, 
uh, because every every attempt to resist nonviolently didn't change a thing. So that's sort of my analysis of the situation. What are your reactions to that? I think you're right in many ways. Look, I, I, I think that um, the we in Palestine have been living death by a thousand cuts. And because it's death by a thousand cuts, people have really ignored it. Yeah, when you look at the blockade, this blockade is is has been brutal. It's been brutal on Gaza. And and th- at most we get a um what, what's the terminology? Grave concern. Yeah. That's that's it. We've seen as Palestinians, we've seen how futile the international system is. You know, just this year alone, this year alone, leave aside October 7th. Up until October 7th, this had been the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank. We'd seen that not only had this racist government come along, but but they were being met in, in world capitals um, and greeted with in world capitals. They We also saw that it, this was the highest rate of home demolitions ever. And, um, and the Israelis were very openly talking about taking over Al-Aqsa Mosque compound with all expressions of grave concern by the international community. Even looking at the United States, the United States did, has not only done Palestinians um, a, a disservice, that's, that's putting it mildly, but you can see this about face that they're now trying to, to do. They spent, this particular president, Biden, has spent all of his years in office yeah. casting Abu Mazen to the side. And I, I'm not a fan of Abu Mazen, just so that everybody's clear. I, I don't like him. He should have resigned long ago. I was one of the first people to call for his resignation. I've written about why the PA should be folded. So really, like, uh, I, I don't need to go on the record and, and talk about my history with the PA. Um, and yet... Here we are now, after all of these years of shoving him in a corner and base effectively t- treating him as persona non grata, they're, they're, they're now realizing, oh, wow, there's a guy that we could probably pull out and, and, and shove into Gaza and turn him into the, the prince of Gaza. It's all of the things that you've mentioned, Michael, and more. It's the years of, of the world ignoring us. It's the years of Israel getting away literally with murder. It's the fact that the generation after generation has seen no hope for the future. And the fact that the world has remained so silent to what Israel has done. At a certain point in time, it gets to the point where you say, I'm going to have to do something to change the equation. And that something um, just might involve violence. And again, this isn't something that, it, it it didn't come out of a vacuum. That's the thing that I think is very important for people to understand. And I don't think it's suicidal. I also don't think it's suicidal. Yeah. That's an important distinction to be made and I appreciate you making it. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, our eyes need to be fixed on Gaza but this kind of violence has been taking place throughout the West Bank and even in uh, 48. You wanna you wanna talk a little bit more about that and give us some examples, please? Yes, certainly. First, I'm gonna talk about Gaza without, with, without um, like, with, but not in Gaza. Um, on the eve of October the 7th, there were, we're not even quite sure of the numbers, somewhere between 15,000 to 18,500 Palestinians from Gaza. These tend to be, by the way, men who are on the older side, um, who had work permits to come into Israel to work inside Israel, mostly in construction and in agriculture. On October 7th, the Israeli government turned these men um, from from being legal to illegal. And they engaged in a process of rounding up thousands of Palestinians from Gaza. About 5,000 of these workers, um, these laborers fled to the West Bank where they still remain. But thousands were picked up by the Israelis. And in being picked up by the Israelis, they were beaten. Many of them were tortured. These men talk, uh, spoke about being 
hung from their arms for days. They were um, they were stripped and and kept naked for days on end. Soldiers urinated on them. I'm sure you've seen some of these Abu Ghraib style videos. Um, so soldiers urinated on them. Some of them talked about uh, the the love the the constant abuse of of um, putting them in a in a room and playing that very annoying song Baby Shark to them. They were interrogated, um, kept in prisons that we don't even know where, and we didn't even know their names. A petition was filed by six NGOs to the Israeli court just to know about where they are, who they are, and where they are, and the conditions under which they were treated. And the Israeli high court denied that petition. The, the workers were, were sent back to Gaza a few days ago, but we're not sure if all of them were or just some of them. And so that you understand the, the, what's happening to Palestinians, when you see these videos, that's just a flavor of what has been done to Palestinians in the West Bank. In the West Bank, Israel has killed close to 170 Palestinians, many of them children, just in, since October the 7th. The Israelis have, have taken over large swaths of land. Um, Israeli settlers are using this opportunity to not only attack Palestinians, but to steal their land, preventing them from going back. And we've seen a massive um, uh, campaign to arrest Palestinians throughout the West Bank, including Ahed Tamimi yeah. and her father, uh, Basmit Tamimi. Um, many of these Palestinians are being held incognito, and many of them are being held without charge, without trial, um, the Israeli army has invaded. Diana, you're, uh, you're, we can't hear you now. Janine, refugee camp. Can and there we can. Oh. Can now, you hear me now? Here we can. Yes. The uh, Israeli army has uh, invaded uh, the uh, Janine camp a number of times. They've also mm -hmm. invaded Tul Kerem refugee camp. And they were so petty as to tear up the, the, the road where my friend Shirin Abu Akhle was murdered um, and to destroy even the memorial that had been placed there for her. What's happening in the West Bank is being done under the cover of darkness with just it, the, the, the stories that these um, Palestinians are telling me of the attacks by settlers are, are, are just horrifying horrifying especially in in Hebron where uh, people who are living in in H2 in the in the old part the old city of Hebron um, they've been effectively locked in their houses unable to move now for a month in 48 I've described some of it but what I describe is not even the full amount um, things like people being beaten for simply speaking Arabic the 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 attempts to try to silence Palestinians um, you know, you're allowed to protest anywhere around the world. We can't. It's It's been banned. The Israelis just passed a new law today criminalizing, get this, the consumption of, um, of, of social media that they view as being favorable um, to Hamas. It's, we're in an environment where, again, where it's genocidal and where anything goes. You know, uh, um, the the events of the last few days, um, uh, I've been in touch with Isa Amro, for example, in uh, in Hebron. And uh, uh, I mean, you described it very accurately what's happening there. And some of my groups have met with the Tamimi family in their home and marched with them on Fridays. So uh, it's this is striking very close to home. And of course, many of our Palestinian friends. So I'm glad that you... Uh, talked about Hebron and also the Tamimi family and highlighted their situation. You also, and I know you've been very outspoken on this and, and we have to be, I want to, I want to, uh, because I emphasize this in my talks too, the role of the media. And I want to ask you two specific questions about the role of the media, Deanna. I mean, we used, uh, um, we used to call them uh, hypocritical, then, then uh, complicit. Now it's criminal. 
so let me ask you the two questions. The media, uh, you mentioned uh, your friend Shireen Abu Uh She's not the only journalist who's been targeted uh, by the uh, uh, by Israeli forces. Uh, and, and uh, of course, she was killed a little over a year ago. So the targeting of journalists, talk about that. And then the second question, uh, the Israeli propaganda machine uh, is, is influencing virtually all, I mean, virtually all of the Western media. Um, you have to, I mean, for activists, we kind of can't know where to sort of find it. But for the, for the normal per person consuming the media, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a crime. And it's very difficult to find accurate reporting. So talk to us also about Israeli Hasbara. Certainly. Um, first, I want to begin with with uh, my friend, um, Shireen Abu Akhle. I miss her. I miss her a lot. Um, I miss her because she was a friend. Uh, but I also miss her because in this time of reporting, I can only imagine how she would have be reporting on on Gaza, and she would have done it with care, with compassion, with bringing forward the stories of of ordinary people, um, like a woman who was supposed to get married, and bought her wedding dress, and the day of her of her what was supposed to be her wedding, the Israeli army killed her. Um, instead of wearing her wedding dress, she was buried in a different type of white uh, cloth. But in addition to Shireen, I think that we owe a huge amount of gratitude for all of the Palestinian journalists who have put their lives on the line to allow us to see. And these are people like my friend Wa'al Dahdouh, another Al Jazeera reporter who's in the Gaza Strip, who um, we call him a mountain because nothing moves him. Nothing moves him. He's such a mountain um, because he's such an iconic figure that the Israelis ended up killing his wife and two of his children and his grandchild, one of his grandchildren. Um, and the very next day, well, I went on the air and said, it is my duty as a journalist to bring to you the reality of what it is that we're living. That's what kind of a, a mountain he is. And to see him weep brought me to, to, to beyond tears. The Palestinian journalists have been doing the work that Western journalists should be doing. But the Western journalists are not doing it for a couple of reasons. One is, and this is important to note, no Western journalist is allowed into Gaza, not even just before, uh, not even just since October the 7th, but before October the 7th. Um, Israel has made it very difficult for, for Western journalists to go in there. You have to tell them why you're going there, how many days you're going to go down, down there. It has to be, as they put, coordinated. You can't go on certain days. You can't go on the Saturday. You can't go on, on Jewish holidays, blah, 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 blah. All to say, Western journalists are not there. Um, but the other reason that they, are, but the ones that are there now are there embedded, by the way, with the Israeli army. But in addition to the, the, the debt of gratitude that we owe to Palestinian journalists, for, for for showing us what's happening. Israel has actually been targeting journalists. And yeah. so far, um, the number is 37 journalists that Israel has killed just since October the 7th. This is the highest number of journalists killed in any place around the world, um, according to the Committee to Pr Protect Journalists. And it's the the highest number um, since the Committee to Protect Journalists has, has been documenting, since they've been operational since 1992. It shows you that what Israel is trying to do is extinguish. They're trying to make sure that you do not see what is happening. Now back to Western journalists. 
the Western journalists now, I, and I want to be careful. It's not all. It's not all. Some have done a very good job, but many of them have not. Many of them have effectively turned into stenographers for the Israeli army. Um, why? In part because they're not there in Gaza, but in part because they have accepted this dehumanization campaign that has been waged against Palestinians. So everything from, um, uh, you'll see this very clever phraseology, Hamas-led Ministry of Health. I've never in my life heard, for example, the Likud-led Ministry of Health when it comes to Israel. You know, just it's the Palestinian Ministry of Health, where it should be. But instead, it's the Hamas-led Ministry of Health. Why? To demonize. Um, and what's interesting about this Hamas-led Ministry of Health is that is that they've gotten journalists not only to believe that somehow we are faking our own deaths, which we are not, you know, we have to prove ourselves dead, hmm. that um, it, it got so bad that Palestinians had to issue, and they did it two weeks ago, um, a, a, a 212 page document, Michael, listing at the time all 7,067 Palestinians who'd been killed, along with their ages, their names, and their ID numbers. Now, it's, that's not the only part of dehumanization. We've heard your president, I'm not an American citizen, so he's not my president, um, but we've heard your president also buy into this myth of this of the of the numbers. We've also heard them talk about these um, about things like decapitations when there hasn't been anybody who's proven that. And in fact, the journalists who were there who were allowed into the area where they claimed that there were these decapitations said that they didn't see any such thing. And the Israeli media itself, Israeli media itself, is not reporting this at all either. It's been, um, but yet we've seen that Sarah Sidner from CNN picked it up. Um, my, uh, Nick Robertson from CNN picked it up. You know, Sarah Sidner apologized. She didn't apologize on camera, though. She apologized via Twitter. Um, Nick Robertson hasn't bothered to apologize. We've seen people from MSNBC just pick up the statements willy nilly. And then once again, your president pick it up only to then have to have a clarification issued um, regarding these beheading. You know, he said, I never thought I'd see beheaded babies. Well, yeah, because you didn't see them because there That's aren't right. any. Um, and so the Western media has contributed very much to this dehumanization process and uh, and has unquestioning, without questioning, has reported what Israel is saying as fact. This is why I'm so concerned with the Shifa Hospital. Um, you know, the Shifa Hospital, for those who don't know, is uh, is the largest hospital in Gaza City. It's a hospital that was used to be just a hospital, but because of the blockade, was forced to become everything. It was supposed to be able to do operations. To, to have dialysis, to you name it. And it's because it was turned into the central hospital that Israel now wants to bomb it. And we hear journalists come forward and say things like, like the BBC said, does Hamas have tunnels under hospitals and schools? And sure enough, the very next day, Israel bombed a hospital. They're, they're playing the role and have become complicit not only in the dehumanization of Palestinians, but in this genocide. And I think that we're going to look back on this and many a thesis is going to be written about the very shameful role that the media has played. Um, not Again, not all, but the shameful role that the media has played. I do want to highlight that there are four people, three, uh, four Palestinian journalists um, who are not part of any news channel who've been really risking their lives to show us Lot, exactly what's happening. A uh, young man named Martas, who's 22 years old, a woman named Plestia, who I believe is 21 years old, um, a woman named Bisan, who is, I think, 19 years old, and a little boy named Aboud, who I believe is 15 years old. They have been so active on social media 
trying to get um, to the world to see what's happening. And the amazing thing is that all four of them, before this attack on Gaza, they used to just take pictures of how beautiful Gaza was. That's hmm. it. I have two or three questions that have been asked by folks, so, so let me get to them. Uh, one of them is uh, Senator Durbin is the only senator to call for a ceasefire. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? It's Senator the, the, Durbin the, the, from uh, Illinois. I don't, I, you know, I don't know, and I'm not American, so I don't know enough about I'm Canadian. For those who don't know, um, uh, I don't know enough about the various um, senators, but I do want to make a, a, a statement about Congress in general, um, uh, the House and the Senate. Uh, what what the what Congress has done, what 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 they've been doing is is deplorable. The fact that that there's only I think it's seven now of out of five hundred and thirty five representatives of the House. That have called for a ceasefire is shameful. The fact that Rashida Tlaib yesterday was censured is, yeah. is shameful. Um, and the fact that the so-called left, including Bernie Sanders, um continue to to you know push ahead and allow um allow Israel to to continue to bomb shows Palestinians that that this is not just an Israeli attack, an Israeli massacre. Uh, um, against Gaza, but uh, but but an American one as well, an American one as well. Another couple of questions from my uh, co-chair from ICAD USA, uh, the attorney Robert Herbst. Uh, Bob's just been back from Berlin, and he asked two questions. So let me put them together, and then you can uh, respond. Okay, he says the actions you're describing in the West Bank sound very much like the actions of Nazi neighborhood groups in the late 1930s, which are described in the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Do you think it's appropriate to point out that analogy? So many of us have shrunk back from doing so in the past. So that's one. And uh, the other one is uh, he was just in uh, Berlin at a rally uh, and march with upwards of 50,000 in solidarity with Palestinians in a country uh, where the government previously didn't allow such rallies, do you think that this might be the beginning of an international mass movement that might potentially bring significant pressure to end Israeli apartheid? Yes. Um, so let me deal with the first Those question. Those are two separate questions, but the I put them question. together because of our friend Bob. Yep. Um, thank you, Bob, for both questions. Look, regarding the first uh, question, um, you know, is, is, is Israel doesn't have a monopoly on genocides, like in in terms of what what is done that leads up to a genocide, um, and and I say this because because if we simply focus on the Holocaust as being the only genocide, we are doing a disservice, obviously, to humanity, but also to the six million. Um, Jewish people who were slaughtered during the Holocaust. Never again is supposed to mean something. And the lessons of never again are supposed to mean something. And I think that it's very important for people to understand that what Israel is doing is it's carrying out a genocide. And again, this it's not Israel doesn't own that term. Uh, they don't have a monopoly over that term. That we've seen other genocides. We've seen it in Rwanda, for example, in former Yugoslavia. We've seen this carried out, and I think we have to really be aware of the various stages that uh, that are being done in carrying out a genocide. And what is happening now is very much along the lines of genocide. The whole dehumanization campaign um, that we've seen that's been perpetrated against against Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but all Palestinians. And I, I you know, I can show you um, picture after picture after picture of, of what it's like to live here. Just today, I was, I was driving and I, uh, they, there was a, I, I wish I could show you on the screen, but I can't. Um, there was a picture of, of uh, half a face of Ismail Haniye and the other half was Adolf Hitler. And it says, it's either us or them. We must uh, eliminate Islamic terror, okay? 
And and so you can see th this is this is the fervor that's happening here now. And these neighborhood militias are exactly designed to do that, to create a system in which you are being watched by your neighbor. You're afraid to speak out. You're afraid to post on social media. You're afraid to, to, to do anything. And I have to be honest, Michael, I personally, look, I'm, I'm not afraid, but I have to tell you, my friends are terrified for me. They're afraid that I'm going to be arrested. They're afraid that I'm going to be on one of these neighborhood watch lists. Mm -hmm. They're afraid. And I've already I've seen my own personal friends arrested and placed on these neighborhood watch lists. I think we have to call it out for what it is um, because they want us to be silent and we have to keep talking about it. In terms of what's happening in Berlin. And 300,000 in London and Jewish about, Voice for Peace at the Statue of Liberty and uh, right. et cetera. You know. it, it's London, it's Toronto, it's Washington, D.C., it's New York, it's uh, Santiago, Chile, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's everywhere, it's in Oslo, it's in Berlin, it's in Madrid, in Paris, everywhere. Um, in Indonesia, 2 million people came out in Indonesia and Jakarta. It's everywhere. That is my international community. It's South Africa. That is my international community. My international community is not the United States of America. It's not my, uh, you know, my country of birth, Canada, or Austria, or any of the other countries that either voted against or abstained in the UN resolution, uniting for peace to try to get a, a ceasefire. Those, those are not, that's not my international community. And it's because these voices are so loud and so bold um, that we now see a change of tune. They don't care about Palestinians in Gaza. Believe me, they don't. The, 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 the G7 and all the, they don't care. But they do care about upsetting the apple cart and upsetting the global system. And, and these huge protests have the potential to upset that global, uh, the global system and to upset the, the apple cart, so to speak. And that's why they're pushing now to have some sort of ceasefire. Again, they don't care about us. If they did, they would have stopped the, they would have stopped Israel within the first week. There's talk here and, and I, I don't know how much uh, uh, to believe, but uh, we hear from uh, Biden and Netanyahu, Netanyahu and pro-Israel pundits about the possibility of escalation into a regional conflict uh, with Iran, Iraq, and Syria, uh, Lebanon, etc. Um, is this just cover, uh, or or is this something? Is this something to be concerned about? I think right now um, the regional part that you should be worried about is what Israel has designed for, for Gaza. Israel has made it clear what their plans are for Gaza. Yeah. Um, and the plans are, so for, in case any uh, anybody doesn't know, uh, the foreign minister said it, Netanyahu has been saying it, uh, we have the president himself saying this is, that there are no innocents in Gaza. Um, their plan is to kick Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula, into Egypt. And, and and they've been doing this the the bombing campaign that um, that Israel has been waging, uh, coupled with all of the other things that they've been doing, cutting off fuel, water, electricity, and uh, um, and food, um, is all designed to create panic, fear, and uh, and no safe space. So the the so that people know, and I, and I want to be clear about this, forty two percent of the the Palestinians who've been killed in Gaza have been killed in the so-called safe areas. Yeah. 50% of the structures that have been bombed in in Gaza are in the so-called safe areas. Um and and the reason that the Israelis are doing this is they're not sending the message go to the south it's safe for you. No, they're sending the message leave. And what they're planning on doing is opening up the pushing Egypt to open up the Rafah border. We've already seen a lot of talk of this and pushing um as many 
Palestinians as possible into the Sinai. Israel has said Gaza is going to emerge from this smaller in size and smaller in population. And we've seen plan after plan come um, come forward uh, in which, uh, which the Israelis, by the way, have not denounced, um, in which they, they, they aim to kick Palestinians into Sinai. That is what can trigger something that's far more regional. If it wasn't, as it stands now, what's stopping the, What's stopping Lebanon? What's stopping Egypt? What's stopping Jordan? By the way, and and the the king knows this as well. The king of uh, King Abdullah of Jordan. The Israelis are not going to stop with Gaza. Right. Mark my words. Mark my words. The Israelis are going to go and uh, and collect people um, who they suspect of being Hamas in the West Bank and deport them to Jordan. Mark my words. That will be the next phase of of all of this. You know, Diana, let, 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 I'm yeah. sorry. Let me, let me, I want to pick up on that. Uh, uh, and, and I apologize for interrupting, but you're the, you're the fourth person now that I've heard that, uh, it, you know, so-called population transfer. Well, that's just a euphemism, right? Ethnic cleansing. Um, not, it's not going to just remain in Gaza, but the West Bank. And you're the fourth person I've heard in the last week to talk about that. And it's not just Hamas, but suspected Hamas or anybody who speaks up or or any of that. So I really want you to kind of make this point hard for us so that we hear this. Please. When Israel speaks of eliminate, there's no way to eliminate Hamas so that everybody knows. There's no way to eliminate Hamas. Hamas is part and parcel of the Palestinian political movement. Um, you can get rid of parts of it. There's going to be another thing that's going to spring up. They tried it with Fatah. They tried it with the PLO. It's never worked, and they should have learned their lesson by now, but the Israelis are dumb. Um, that said, what they are going to do is, because they want to, quote, unquote, eliminate Hamas, I suspect that they're going to go after anybody who they think is a member of Hamas, who's ever been in prison for being a member of Hamas, um, or who they suspect of being a member of Hamas or sympathetic to Hamas. And they will pick them up and deport them to Jordan. This is not new. They did this in the 90s as well when they deported um, members of Hamas to southern Lebanon. And it was only later that they ended up being brought back, 400, 400 and something. Um, the, the, this is precisely what I suspect that they're going to do. And I think that the king knows this. Yeah. And that's why the the king, uh, King Abdullah and Queen Rania, have been so vocal about about what Israel's doing in uh, in in Gaza, and uh, and because they see that, that that this is the next step, and the pressure that is now being exerted on Egypt to aid the ethnic cleansing of of Palestinians from Gaza is incredible. It is incredible. And we must be aware, like we, you know, keep your eyes on it. We, this happened in 2008, 2009, and then in 2012, and then in 2014, everybody said, oh, what about the Egyptians? Blah, 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 the Egyptians. And please keep in mind, it's not Egypt's responsibility to, to, out, to help Israel ethnically cleanse Gaza. It's Israel's responsibility to stop. All eyes have to be on what Israel is doing. And yes, the Egyptians need to facilitate more coming into Gaza and those who are wounded to get out and to be treated, um, but also be brought back in. But I don't want to hear this, this constant chorus that we heard in 2008, 2009, 2012 and 2014, and then 2018, that somehow it's Egypt's responsibility to open up the border. That's exactly what Israel wants. It wants to get rid of Palestinians and they want world pressure to be on Egypt to take them in rather than for Israel to stop killing Palestinians. We used to call this uh, conflict. Then we called it occupation, then apartheid. Thankfully, you know, Yesh Dean, B'Tselem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International caught up with what Palestinians had been saying for years. But now we finally call it for what it is, ethnic cleansing and genocide. Um, associated with that, of course, is a settler colonial uh, uh, paradigm, right? A settler colonial framework. But that, you know, when, when I talk to various groups, settler colonialism sounds like such a, an academic term. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, of course it is. Uh, to unpack for 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 those of us here. Unpack what the the impact of settler colonialism as opposed to uh, uh, colonialism. Okay, so colonialism is all right. Well, I'll do it even simpler than that. What Israel wants to do is erase us and replace us. That's it. That's what settler colonialism is. Erase, replace. Very simple. Um, different from colonialism, where they're, they're not aiming to erase, they're not aiming to replace. Um, it's just simply a question of them ruling over, etc. cetera. Um, and what Israel wants to do is literally that, erase, replace, erase, replace, end of story. And, and, and the form of that it takes, because it's a long form, his, it's through things like building and expanding settlements to erase Palestinians, replace them with Israelis, to what we see in Gaza, perpetrating genocide, erase Palestinians, and believe me, they will replace them with Israelis. That is the essence of what Israel is doing. So yes, I, I like the wall of consensus that exists when it comes to calling this apartheid. I think that that's very, very, very important because that's what it's like to live under this system. But I think it's also important to understand what Israel wants to do, which is they desperately seek to erase us. That's why we have these slogans like a land for people for people without a land. And they want to replace us. Okay, so that, so that one day um, they will just, you know, uh, there were no such thing as Palestinians. We've heard this time and again. That's this is the essence of what Israel is doing. Where um, are, are I know there's been these popular uprisings, and you mentioned them uh, in the millions around the world. Are there any world leaders or nations where you're finding support? Uh, um, yeah. So where 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 are you finding your support? Uh, for for uh, Palestinian life, for Palestinian oh, rights, Palestinian rights, from those who have had to live under the 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 boot of an of another nation, and from those who understand what colonialism is, who understand what occupation is, who understand um, what apartheid is, Ireland, South Africa, Colombia. Bolivia, um, gosh, the the list of Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Yemen, um, you name it. You know, all of these countries where we've seen people and their leaders stand up and either not have an ambassador here to begin with or recall their ambassador or speak very forcefully on behalf of Palestinians. Look, I, I say this again, this isn't just about Palestinians. We're, we're witnessing the, the death of the international legal system as we know it. And I, I fear for humanity if this is allowed to continue. I really do. I know that there have been many Jewish groups who stood on the side of Palestine, and, and especially here in the U.S., that's very important given you know the, the how uh, zionism uh, is the dog that wag uh, the tail that wags the dog here you know in this country and christian zionism uh, uh its impact here in the us uh so uh jewish support it would seem to me is is very important here and there uh talk to us a little bit about the jewish support for uh palestine at this time um look i i have to say that here in in palestine there's only been a few people who've been very vocal and speaking up against what Israel is doing. It's been small numbers, um, you know, but but their voices are are very important to, to me personally. People like Ilan Pape, uh, who is not only a, a mentor, but a friend um, and and others who, who have been very vocal in saying that this shouldn't be done in their name. There, there, there were even some people who whose family members were killed who have been standing up and and standing up to the to the Jake Tappers of the world and standing up to the BBCs of the world and saying that they don't want this done in their name. And that, and that is very, very powerful um, for me personally. 
But also there have been a lot of uh, Jewish groups in the United States, JVP in particular, has been phenomenal in, in their opposition to um, Israel's bombing campaign in saying that this should not be done in their name. In, in, um, in leading the way in, in so many ways um, when it comes to things on the Hill to try to get people to stop, uh, to call for a, a, a complete ceasefire, um, to the sit-in that they did at, uh, at Grand Central and so on. You know, we see that, we see that. And that is so, it, it's so important because our solidarity is not transactional. It it is true solidarity. Um, it means that that we together want to shape a better world, and uh, and because we together want to shape a better better world, we work with one another. Um, and that's just been that has been really been phenomenal uh, to for me to witness. I, I have to say though here. The, there have been a lot of voices that have sadly swung the other way. Um, people who were once allies who no longer are, who um, don't recognize the the evils of the occupation and the evils of ethnic cleansing. And um, and that's been very disheartening for me. You know, Deanna, we, we keep hearing that everything has changed now. And Yes. Um, uh, of course, uh, how can it not be? The first step, uh, of course, is, is a ceasefire. But wh where do we go after that? Michael, this is an incredibly excellent question. After that, we must understand that it's for Palestinians to decide. That's it. It's not up to the West to decide. It's not up to America to decide. It's not up to America to bring in some prince that, that on October the 6th, they couldn't stand. But now, you know, on, on whatever, November the 8th, wherever we are today, they suddenly like. It's up, for, it's up to us to decide. But anything that happens in Gaza, um, you know, of course, depends on what happens in the aftermath, whether, you know, I, I don't even want to think about the worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, but no matter what happens, we can't go back to a situation in which Israeli uh, uh, security is put ahead of Palestinian freedom. We can't go back to a system in which this, this decrepit, apartheid, racist, colonial um, system is allowed to fester again. We can't, we can't do that. We can't go back to a place where Palestinians are constantly being kept in cages, um, denied their freedom, but not not just in the not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well. That has got to be shattered. You know, I I I'm going to tell you a personal sort of anecdote, um, just so that you understand what what it is that I'm talking about. And I've written about it, so you might read about it somewhere very soon as well. You know, in, in 2005, I was one of the lawyers that was involved in what was called the disengagement plan. I was um, trying to work with, I was, I was, a, I was uh, working with the Palestinian negotiating team. Um, we, anyway, uh, and uh, the Americans had basically implored us as the Palestinian negotiating team to say, work with the Israelis to try to make this disengagement work. Now, now you'll recall, or if people don't recall, I'll describe it very quickly. The disengagement plan was a plan that had been concocted by uh, Israeli prime minister and war criminal, uh, Ariel Sharon. And what it entailed was the Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip and from a few isolated settlements in the northern part of the West Bank but it didn't actually end the occupation. All it did was it ended the settlements, it ended the colonialism, but it didn't end the occupation. And at the time, uh, President, I was in the White House it, roughly around this time, and, and President Bush said to me, what is it that needs to be done to make the Gaza Strip viable? And I, I said, it, it, it can't be turned into an open air prison. And he said, be specific. And so I was specific. I said, we need to have an airport. We need to have a seaport. We need to have a connection between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 
and um, we need to be free. You know, we need to we we need to be free. That it's just that simple. We need to be free, and uh, we need to have control of our airspace. You know, all the things. And he, this was President Bush. Um, he, he, I think, on a level understood that. I don't really know what he understood or didn't understand, but but um, he kind of nodded his head. And a week later, I was involved in uh, in some negotiations with what was then, what is still, the Israeli Ministry of Defense. And at this meeting, the one of the guys from the Ministry of Defense, um, we said, again, we we're talking about how to make Gaza viable, right? You can't you can't turn it into a prison? You can't turn it into a, it, that will not be viable. That's just going to create a pressure cooker, which we saw, which is what it, they actually did. And the and so we start talking about the most mundane thing, which is scanners. These are scanners that will scan um, the things that are coming into Gaza and coming out of Gaza. And the Israeli representative turned to me and said, "Listen, the level of scanner that we need is so high that it actually doesn't even exist." Yeah. That was my look, Michael. That was my look. Now, I was in the room with a bunch of other diplomats, and some of them had the same look that you did, that you just had. But none of them flinched. And none of them realized the absurdity of it. And instead turned to me and said, well, you know, we're, Deanna, you're just going to have to work with, with Israel. But the problem, of course, yes. with that was that their thinking was that the only way that Israel will be secure is if Palestinians are insecure and denied their rights. Again, the formula is that it, the only way that Israel will be secure is if Palestinians are insecure and denied their rights. And, and I tell you this story because that has been the thinking on the part of the members of the United States, like the Western international community for 75 years, that the only way is that Israel is secure is when Palestinians are insecure and denied their rights. And that formulation must come to an end, must come to an end. What the shape, what the form, all of that, I don't know because it's up to us to decide and we're not there yet. But that, but I can tell you with 100% certainty, that formulation must come to an end. Diana, uh, Diana you've given us uh, uh, your passion, your insight, your analysis. You've given us your presence, which is so important. Uh, any closing thoughts for us? I just want to thank you for taking the time um, to to invite me to listen and uh, and thank you. Really, thank you for, for con continuing to work for Palestinian freedom. Um, I, I really do thank you. Well, we look forward to uh, a time when we can invite you back to Fort Wayne uh, and you'll be able to say yes and then uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. All thank right. You. Diana, thank you and blessings to you and know that we hold you in our hearts and we stand in solidarity with you and all of our Palestinian friends. Thank you everybody thank for joining us. We'll see you next time.